Hi everyone, welcome to the Real Estate Tax Tip channel. My name is Cherry Chen, a charter professional accountant located in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. And I'm on a mission to become Google Map for hardworking Canadians seeking financial freedom. And today I have a very special guest here with us, um, Victor Menage, um, the president of uh, Ottawa Real Estate Investor Organization, Oreo for short, and a senior partner of Y Street Capital, um, which primarily invests in uh, real estate development in Ottawa as well as in the US. Um, we have him here sharing his insight with us. Uh, he's also the host of real estate a real estate podcast called Real Estate Expresso. Um, so welcome, Victor. Great to be here. Yeah, nice to uh, see you, and I'm so glad to have you here. A little bit about you. I know you come from a really technological background, right. um, engineering way more tech savvy than I am. So what's the change? Why are you full-time in real estate? How did you jump the ship? Yeah, definitely not the usual career path into the world of real estate development. Yeah. So I started actually as an electrical engineer d designing microprocessors back in, even in the 1980s, designing wow. processors, using all kinds of different applications all over the world in telecom. I've got chips in seatback displays on Airbus aircraft. Oh. Um, Wi-Fi access points from Cisco and Apple, uh, Pachinko Apache slot machines in Japan with Sammy Sega, um, Hewlett Packard storage networks, all kinds of weird and wonderful applications all over the world. And I was probably on my 18th trip to Tokyo. Uh, wow. on, we were building a new cellular network in Japan with the number four carrier in Japan. And it was just burning me out physically. I mean, that 12-hour mm -hmm. time zone going there at, back and forth every two weeks, it was just not the right thing for me. It wasn't the right thing for my family. And so I literally resigned my vice president of engineering position and decided to take a left turn in my career. Now, interestingly enough, the company hired me back as a consultant two days a week for the same money. Don't ask me how that works. <laughs> so that extended my financial runway as I made that transition. And it's been a great experience. It's been a great learning and uh, love what I'm doing today. Wow, that's uh, that's you're the OG of like chip processing yeah. developer. <laughs> wow, that's that's amazing, amazing. But how did you start? I mean, obviously there is the motivation of right. like being burned out, but how did you get into real estate? There are so many options out there. Well, in fact, I looked at doing another tech venture as, mm. and I've done quite a few. I've done five different mergers and acquisitions, done one IPO and wow. thought about doing yet another uh, tech venture. and just looked at the landscape, in particular in the world of hardware design, I said, you know what, the minimum you need to get anything done is 50 million. Mm -hmm. And if you're an investor, and you, you're gonna invest in this, maybe in four years I'll get you your money back, and maybe in year five I'll make you a profit. Are you lining up for that investment? Probably no. not, no. right? And But yet that is the reality of that business. So unless you have the depth of pockets of an Intel or a Samsung or someone like that, it's a really hard business. And so I st started looking around and said, well, what else can I contribute to that would be meaningful, that would leave a legacy, that would be that would exercise some creativity? Mm -hmm. And real estate just kept popping up over and over and over again. And when you look at the fact that most of the wealth in the world has, in fact, been created in either real estate or oil and glass, it kind of made sense. Mm -hmm. So what was your first investment then? My very first investment was actually here in Ottawa, and I took a very business approach. Mm. Uh, I saw Ottawa being the nation's capital. Yeah. We have a bunch of folks that come through the downtown core, parliamentary staff, embassy staff, military officers, contractors, on a short-term basis. And the government tends to spend money in six-month increments. Mm -hmm. So the 12-month unfurnished lease is useless to those folks. Yeah. And Airbnb didn't exist back then. So I basically started buying and building a portfolio of medium-term rentals oh. and just started buying properties within a four-block radius of Parliament, delivering a fully furnished product that for a small incremental investment would get me 35% more rent for just furnishing and delivering a turnkey experience. Because I figured out what the housing allowance was and I said, can I deliver a product for that number? And will I make money at that number? And the answer was yes. Now, in, the, in retrospect, it was a good business. It wasn't a great business, but it was a good business. I took a very business approach to it. 
so that was that was my very first investment. Oh wow! So then, how did you jump from that type of investment to today? Because you are doing uh, development. Correct. Yeah, you're not only doing development locally, but you're also doing some developments in the U.S. as well. We're how mostly did you... U.S. Oh, We're actually, mostly US. cool, yeah, cool. Absolutely. Share. Yeah. So what happened was. I resigned my position in 2009, mm. and uh, I had already started investing in real estate in about 2006, so mm -hmm. I made my first investments back then. But if you might remember, there was something going on in the U.S. around that time yeah. frame, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. it was a terrible time to be playing defense in the U.S., mm -hmm. a great time to be playing offense. You could buy assets for far less than replacement cost. Mm -hmm. And so I saw the opportunity. I said, you know what? There's more upside than downside. In retrospect, I made a lot of mistakes, but it, the environment was at least forgiving of those mistakes, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, it worked out. What's the uh, mistakes? I'm curious. I started too small, first mm -hmm. and foremost. I took the courses that everyone else took. I went to the weekend boot camps, and they go teach you to flip houses and mm -hmm. wholesale properties and do all these other crazy things that, frankly, are an earned income approach. Mm -hmm. They. And, and the projects were too small. When the projects are too small, they don't throw off enough cash to build a sustainable business. Mm. So you end up being essentially the self-employed, grinding it out. Maybe you have a partner or two, but still you're grinding it out and the projects are too small. So ended up wasting a lot of time, frankly. Mm. Uh, ended up choosing some of the wrong partners. Um, ended up going with properties that were inexpensive, but not necessarily the best properties. That was a very powerful lesson. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the, the laws of supply and demand, to me now, are kind of like a, it's like gravity, it's a law of physics almost. And when you obey the laws of supply and demand, think good things happen. When you try and violate the laws of supply and demand, that's when bad things happen. So for example, I personally will not invest in Detroit. Mm. Nothing wrong with Detroit. Some people have had very good success in Detroit, but I will not invest in Detroit because it's a shrinking city mm. that's lost almost half its population. There's a reason you can buy properties for far less than replacement cost. Even today, mm -hmm. you can buy properties for far less than that. So those were some of the lessons. So you said that you, the mistake was, uh, if, if I may, the mistake was that you started small. Yeah. And so what have you... Um, I guess, switch from, learn from that, and what are you doing today? Well, today we're doing much larger projects. We're developing everything from multifamily apartments, senior housing, storage. We're doing a lot of land development. We have several mm -hmm. thousand acres of land that we're developing. Mm -hmm. And it's all about value creation. And some people will try and play the arbitrage game or maybe buy something at a discount and, and hope to make money that way, and that's fine. There's, but it's, it's a competitive environment. There's mm -hmm. too much money chasing too few opportunities. So I prefer not to play in that game. You know, it's like going to an auction. Mm. The winning bidder almost always pays too much. Yeah. So I'd rather not, I don't like auctions. If I can go into the marketplace and see an opportunity that nobody else sees because they don't have the same idea that I have in my head for that. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a simple example. We're yep. working on a project right now. It's on the edge of Colorado Springs. It's mm -hmm. 77 million square feet. It's mm -hmm. eight, almost 1,800 acres. Wow. It is a major expansion of the city of Colorado Springs. We bought that land for 23 cents a square foot. What? Yes. It's crazy. <laughs> How did you get those deal? Uh, we, it fell in our lap, quite frankly. Hmm. And at first we dismissed it and we said, oh, it's too big, it's too complicated, it's too whatever. And it took a couple of weeks to wrap our mind around it. We actually had a meeting with the county uh, planning staff, and at that meeting, people from the city of Colorado Springs showed up uninvited. Oh. We, yeah. So we're meeting with the county, because the property's in the county, and the city shows up. And they said, you know, if you were to annex into the city, you would get access to utilities. We would be very supportive of that. They must have said it four times. So wow. how often does the city show up uninvited to a meeting? And how often do you hear these type of, like, we're very supportive of what you're doing. Right. Not, not anywhere I heard from local cities, not to say that local cities any bad. It's just I haven't right. heard anything like that. Right. 
So this will eventually be, you know, it's a it's a long range project. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, four different densities of residential, commercial, retail, schools, fire department. Wow. Uh, the whole electric substations. Yeah, this is a planned community. Be yeah, about yeah, yeah. 8,400 rooftops eventually. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Yeah. So how are you finding, the, what's your role in these projects? How are you finding partners? So our team, we have a core team of partnership mm -hmm. uh, that forms Y Street Capital. We're five partners and we also have staff as well. So mm -hmm. on our average daily staff meeting, we're between nine and 13 people, depending mm -hmm. on how many of our interns happen to be on the call. Mm -hmm. We also did on that particular project, find a couple of local partners uh, mm -hmm. because we felt that was important. So one of the individuals uh, ended you know, who is you know, a major investor in the project, also owns a defense contracting company or had owned a defense contracting company. He sold it, made mm -hmm. a lot of money. Today runs the defense incubator in Colorado Springs. Wow. Uh, very you know, well-established fixture in the community. The planner who was working for us used to be the head planner for the county. So getting people pulling people out of those roles into working on, on staff for, for projects like this is a game changer because then you really have you know real inside knowledge. Another one of our partners, his father used to be the county commissioner. Oh, wow. His wife is the current county commissioner. So You he, know everybody. Exactly. So, yeah. so this individual can pick up the phone and people will answer because mm -hmm. he's just well connected. He can invite them over and have a barbecue at his house, and he does. Mm -hmm. So it's really understanding who the players are, who the power brokers are, and understanding what the needs and wants are. Now, what's very interesting about this particular project is that our immediate neighbor is Shriver Air Force Base, which is U.S. Space Command. Mm -hmm. Now, it's probably the fastest growing segment of the military, and they've already hinted their shopping list of what they'd like to see next door. So we have a pretty good idea where to start. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Wow. This is very exciting. So um, I guess because I'm not in that space, right. I see in my in my mind, I see to me, I see a lot of fear. I don't know how you handle that fear. I mean, tomorrow I'm going to talk at Oreo um, at the event talking about my purchase, and I'm sure. going to touch on fear as well. I don't know if that's something that you are comfortable sharing. Like, sure. don't you have a lot of fear in terms of the magnitude of the project? Or maybe this is just one of the many. They are all similar in size. Well, fear is one of those things that is, it's an emotion to be managed. It, it can be a guide, mm -hmm. and yeah, we all have it, I have it. Sometimes you encounter a roadblock and you say, oh, shoot, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you don't really know how you're going to solve that particular problem. So we all encounter those types of situations. Mm -hmm. What I've discovered is that often I'm able to figure it out. doesn't mean always, but yeah. often enough. Uh, and we have a good team. Mm -hmm. That makes a big difference. Yeah, for that sure. makes a big difference. Yeah. It's a difficult environment today. For example, you know, last year, if I go across all the breadth of our projects, we probably raised, I'm going to guess, maybe $38 million in capital mm -hmm. last year in, in equity. Mm -hmm. Our goal was to probably raise a similar number this year. I don't think we're going to achieve that. It's a much more difficult environment. Mm -hmm. People are not investing as um, actively as they did this time last year. So it, it's a completely different environment. So it, it means some things are taking longer, some projects have been put on the shelf, some things have been paused. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. That's fantastic, which lead me to ask you this question. Um, you have your own podcast, yes. you are the president of Oreo, so yeah. you've seen so many, you've met so many real estate investors out there. What are you seeing on the street, and yourself included, what are you doing in today's tight market? How are you? dealing with all these uh, rising interest rate, not just rising interest rate, there's the inflation cost, so everything is costing more. I mean, other than the piece of land that you just picked up, <laughs> but everything is normally costing more. So how are you as a, an experienced real estate investor, or what would you advise other people do? Like, is it a good time to buy? How would you play defense in your portfolio? Yeah, that's a great question. In today's environment, actually construction costs are pretty reasonable right now mm. because uh, certain material costs have come down in price. Lumber has certainly come down in price. Mm -hmm. You know, if I go back to May of 2022, 
lumber prices peaked at fourteen hundred and fifty dollars per thousand board foot as the commodity price for the for that mm -hmm. material. Today it's they're sub four hundred dollars, so it's a big big reduction in lumber costs. So lumber prices are actually quite reasonable. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. finished goods like air conditioners and things like that, yeah, they're expensive. Uh, steel has come down in price, although it's creeping back up again. Labor is Labor, the big one yes. that is really reduced in, in price quite a bit because if you go back 24 months, everyone thought they had two to three years of, of backlog work. Mm -hmm. And those same folks who were charging a premium are now coming back on one knee begging for work. Really? Absolutely. Is it local or are you talking about I'm talking, US I'm talking or universal? Uh, uh, pretty much across the board. Ottawa is a little bit of a special case because we've got large infrastructure projects like the light rail system mm -hmm. that is consuming a lot of labor here in the Ottawa market. Mm -hmm. But even here, we're, we're finding people are being very reasonable and they're quoting numbers that, that are starting to make sense. There's still a few folks out there offering crazy high bids and we send thanks but no thanks. And mm -hmm. uh, this is, we know our numbers, we know what things should cost and, you know, this is what we're looking for. And if that's not you, that's okay, we'll find someone. Mm -hmm. So what about interest rate? How are people handling that like interest rate cost? It, yeah, interest rates are a huge concern mm -hmm. because it's not so much interest rates for construction financing because that's always going to be more expensive mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. Bridge financing is always going to be more expensive. The big question is what's going to happen when you convert to permanent financing. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing development or um, a value-add project where you're simply turning around an existing, let's say, multifamily asset or something like that. That is a huge concern mm -hmm. uh, because, in fact, in today's environment, a lot of things that even a month ago looked like they would work, all of a sudden are not penciling any longer. Mm -hmm. We're seeing uh, situations where uh, things are starting to appear in the market. I won't say distressed yet, although there is some distress for mm -hmm. sure, but we're starting to see things come into the market where people are saying, you know what? As long as I can just get out and break even, I'm, I'm good, you know, they, they, because they see the writing on the wall that it's going to get much more difficult. So that it's absolutely the environment right now. Now, my personal opinion, none of us have a crystal ball, yep. but if I had to look in my crystal ball, the interest rates that we are seeing right now, they're not being set by central bankers. The, the central banks only get to set one interest rate. They don't get to set all of the interest rates because they're all different. They're driven by market forces. Yep. The yield on the 10-year treasury is, is, being, is really the one thing that, that drives the market in terms of permanent financing. Mm -hmm. And that, those bond prices have fallen, which means the yield has gone up, mm -hmm. which means interest rates for mm -hmm. real estate investors seeking permanent financing, those rates have gone up. Mm -hmm. That's a huge concern. Yep. That's a huge concern. I don't, there's no crystal ball. There's no magic answer. My personal belief is that these rates will be forced to come down. And I say that for a very simple reason. I'll speak just about the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. The U.S. government is in a debt trap. Yep. $3.1 trillion just in entitlements. Mm -hmm. Add the cost of servicing the debt. Now you've basically equal everything you're receiving in tax revenue. Yep. No money for defense, no money for anything else, for building roads, no, nothing. No money to staff the government. Right now, the U.S. is running at about 8.5% deficit as a percentage of GDP. Yeah. That's a huge number, yes. right? Yeah. So interest rates cannot stay elevated at this level for very long before all of a sudden people say, you know what? The U.S. was already downgraded once, time to downgrade them again because it's starting to look like Argentina or mm. Zimbabwe or mm. Venezuela. Yeah, I'm just so surprised that they are so stiff and they are still talking about potential of right, uh, rate, uh, rate hike again. I know. Given all these, what you just discussed because they're facts. Like, it's just all going, showing. The math is the math. Yeah, exactly. The numbers yeah. don't care. But then the people who are in power are saying, no, like we may increase it again because the salary, the job market is doing well. Okay, so the jobs report came out last Friday, yep. surprised the market with a big number. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the establishment survey. There's the household survey as well as the establishment mm -hmm. survey. 
the majority of job creation was not in the private sector. Those were mostly all government jobs. <laughs> How are they affording those? They're printing money. They didn't hire those folks because, if you remember, there was the, the whole fiscal cliff negotiation. Mm -hmm. they, they, had no, they couldn't add more to the debt. So up until June of this year, there was very little government hiring. So then, post-June, they started hiring. And now that's happened in July and August, which is why the, the hiring numbers are up. But most of that hiring was government hiring. God. So it's misleading. Yeah. 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 The Federal Reserve looks at it and says, oh, the famous Phillips curve wage price spiral, if you've got more jobs being created and more people coming, you mm -hmm. know, uh, demanding higher pay in the workforce, it's going to be inflationary. Well, wait, wait a minute. It's government jobs. This is not the private sector. This is like a downward spiral it's that we're downward, looking at. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, crazy. That's, that, that's insane. I just hope that we would be able to see some interest rate coming down maybe in the next 12 months. I think it'll happen, and it'll happen suddenly, yeah. because something will break. Mm -hmm. Things broke in March, right? We had a couple of medium-sized banks fail, mm -hmm. but this was not a medium-sized bank issue. It wasn't a Silicon Valley bank issue. Every single bank, not just in the United States, Canada as well, every single bank has the same problem. Mm -hmm. We've had 12, 15 years of record low interest rates. Every single piece of paper that was loaned out over that time period is at a lower interest rate. Yeah. At today's market value, that paper is worth less mm -hmm. for every bank. It doesn't matter whether you're a community bank with one branch or if you're Bank of America and a too big to fail bank like Chase, yeah. you're all in the same boat. Hopefully, we get some relief. That's what I'm, I'm just trying to get at. Yeah. Now, so I know you're doing all um, another event yes. um, with uh, Matt and Matt's is a previous guest and so can you tell us a little bit about your upcoming event and why you're doing this event and it is for a good cause yes so yeah. we're, we're raising money for the ottawa food, or for the canada food bank canada suburb of ottawa on the west end mm -hmm. and we have a number of very well established folks that are fixtures in the auto real estate investment community mm -hmm. that are coming to educate about uh, development about uh, multifamily apartments about uh, investing in the U.S., like a whole range of different things. Underwriting in particular mm. uh, is, is, a, is a key element. We've got someone talking about small projects, you know, the, the, the 2 to 20 size projects, and then we'd be also talking about how to thrive in, in a high interest rate environment as well. That's awesome. So for those of you who are interested in supporting the food bank and also learn something, uh, I understand that this is going to be a great event and it's all the net profit, any proceeds minus uh, all the costs running the event is going to be donated. So learn something and support our local charity. So it's uh, November 12th at the Nepean Sailing Club in the West End of Ottawa. And so uh, we can give you that, those details if you want to put those links in the show notes. That'd be Absolutely. great. Absolutely, yes. So thank you so much. And I have one last question. Of course. Because to me, I'm a parent, and that's always going to be my identity. I'm a mom, and I, I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to lead by example for my kids. So what are you doing today to, or what kind of example are you trying to show your kids? And or what kind of legacy would you like to your kids to see? I just want them to be good people. Mm. That's it. You know, for them to be happy with what they're doing with their lives, for them to be well adjusted, for them to find meaningful, lasting relationships, uh, for them just to be good people. It's mm -hmm. very simple. It's not, not complicated. They don't have to be an entrepreneur. Mm. I'm an entrepreneur. That's in my core. It's in my blood. Yep. But they don't have to be a mini victor. <laughs> it, I don't, that, that, that's not important to me. Mm. Some people want that. I, I, I don't. I just want them to live a good life. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Victor. This has been an amazing, it, it, is, it, it's, it is a treat to hear your take on all these interest rates and learn a little bit about your uh, Colorado um, project as well. And I appreciate that. And thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure. Yes.